Hello, good evening and welcome to the Shakespeare Hour Live. My name is Simon Godwin and I am the Artistic Director of Shakespeare Theatre Company. Welcome back. We're thrilled you're joining us for episode two of our three-part deep dive into The Merchant of Venice. Well, tonight's discussion focuses on the question of the play's relationship to Jewish identity. Uh, last week, all our guests spoke eloquently about the fact that uh, it's impossible to know really what Shakespeare knew or even thought, but there's no doubt that the play has, in history, been used for anti-Semitic purposes. At the same time, there is equally no doubt that going back more than 100 years, actors such as Edmund Keane, Ira Aldridge and Jacob Adler have wanted to play Shylock as an avatar of what today we would call anti-racism and human tolerance. Tonight, we look forward to creating and upholding a safe space where provocative questions can be handled without prejudice as we unpack together this thorniest of plays. Before we get started, um, let me uh, reach out with a thank you to our sponsors. Shakespeare Hour Live is made possible through the visionary support of the Beach Street Foundation and the Shakespeare Theatre Company's 21-22 season is made possible by Michael R. Klein and Joan Fabry and the Harmon Family Foundation. Now to our panellists this evening. So, Kendall Pinkney is a Brooklyn-based theatre artist, creative producer and rabbi. He has been featured in the acclaimed docuseries The New Jew with actor-comedian Guri Alfie, as well as Crooked Media's Unholier Than Thou podcast. His collaborative musical theatre works have been presented at venues such as 54 Below, Joe's Pub, Musical Theatre Factory and Two River. In addition to his creative work, Kendall is the founding artistic director of The Workshop, North America's first arts and culture fellowship centering the work of professional Jukism, Jews of colour, Jewish, Indigenous, Sephardi and or Mizrari artists. Yes, Kendall, good evening and welcome. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me here. Well, it's great to welcome you to the Shakespeare Hour Live. Um, we've been running the show now for really an amazingly long time. Um, so we've covered a lot of ground and we're excited to uh, cover some very new ground this evening. Um, let me um, uh, put you on the spot, Kendall, for a moment. So you're, you're in Brooklyn tonight, is that right? I am in Brooklyn, as you can probably hear from the radiator going on in the background. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a Brooklyn radiator we're hearing. It's a Brooklyn radiator just ting, ting, ting and along. Yeah. That's terrific. And um, so as we enter tonight the realm of Shakespeare, uh, may I um, ask you a, a question that sometimes I share with guests? If you were a Shakespeare character this evening, who might you be? Who, who are you feeling like inside in the kind of Shakespearean canon? Who, who would to express your mood? Uh, I, I, I would say maybe... Oh, goodness. Uh, you know, I'm going to go... It would have to be maybe Puck? Yeah, Something, yeah, oh. feeling a little, little playful, little, you know, it's been a long day, ready to wind down a bit. So yeah, yeah, sure, let's go with that. I'm definitely happy to award you Puck. Cheeky, spirit, <laughs> magical, uh, terrific. Well, look, thank you so much, Kendall. I'm looking forward to talking more um, over the hour. Um, Adam Imowa has served as the Artistic Director of Theatre J since 2015 and is the former Associate Artistic Director of the Tony Award-winning MacArthur Theatre Centre at Princeton University. He has directed at some of the top theatres in the country, including The Public and Theatre Row, Ensemble Studio Theatre, Walnut Street Theatre, Woolly Mammoth Theatre Company and many others. He was the recipient of the 2010 New Jersey Theatre Alliance Applause Award and the 2014 Emerging Nonprofit Leader Award presented by the Fairleigh Dickinson University. He serves on the Executive Committee for the Board of the Alliance of Jewish Theatre and is an inaugural member of the Drama League's Directors Council. Adam, you're with us this evening. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Simon? I'm very well, thank you. I'm in Virginia. Um, it's very peaceful out here on the farm, uh, but um, full of energy and fireworks mentally. Thank you. Excellent. And um, Ad, you are in DC, that's right. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely, yes. We just finished rehearsal, so I'm still in the theatre. My goodness. Can I ask what you've been rehearsing? Uh, yeah, we're rehearsing a, a fascinating 18th century play, which is inspired by Shakespeare, called Nathan the Wise. Great. And, and, and well, perhaps give us a sneak, a sneak preview. How are rehearsals going? Um, uh, we're in the thick of it right now. So we, uh, uh, they're going uh, 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 every day. We're making enormous strides. And it's a fascinating play that rarely gets produced. So it's How exciting. exciting to discover it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and let me give the opportunity to tell our viewers, when do you open? 
<laughs> we open March 21st. Okay, well, there we are. Thank you. I look forward to seeing Nathan the Wise. And, uh, and thanks so much for joining us, Adam, from Washington, D.C. this evening. Uh, Denaya Esperanza, who plays Jessica in the upcoming production of The Merchant of Venice that's been running in Brooklyn at our partner theatre, Theatre for a New Audience, and it's coming to us very soon, is with me this evening. She's going to be and is familiar, uh, will be familiar to audiences at the Shakespeare Theatre Company as she played Juliet in the 2018 Free For All production. Denaya has also appeared at the Goodman Theatre in Chicago, the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, and in New York at Club Thumb, Soho Rep, and Signature Theatre, as well as a television series, Elementary, on CBS. Denaya is a graduate of the Juilliard School. Uh, hello, Denaya. Hi, good evening. Good evening, welcome. Who directed the Romeo and Juliet that you were in at the STC? Adam. Uh, it was a a a a a Alan Paul. Sorry, sorry, Alan. Yeah. You <laughs> yeah. put me on my toes there. Great. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, um, Alan, otherwise known as Adam, uh, Alan Paul. Wonderful. And did, and did you have a good, a good time? Yes, yes. It was a quick, it was very quick, the rehearsal process, because it's a free-for-all. So it was yeah. only a couple of weeks, but, but a great time, a great time, a great run. That's wonderful. And how's the show been doing in Brooklyn? It's been doing really, really well. We didn't get shut down. Um, and we were sold out the last week and a half, which was just great. It was wonderful. And we had some really great talkbacks that last week as well. That's excellent. That's excellent. Well, I say we, we can't wait to welcome you and the show to Washington in a few weeks' time. With us um, tonight monitoring the chat is uh, Sierra Culbertson, STC's Development Coordinator. Please keep the chat, the questions coming. We, we, we relish debate and we relish all of your questions and hearing from you all. And behind the scenes monitoring the technical side of things is Marion Ayers and Gordon Nemo-Smith. My thanks to them. So, without further ado, let me hand over now to our in-house dramaturg and co-host, Drew Lichtenberg. Good evening, Drew. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Simon. And... Uh... Uh, my background is, is unfamiliar. I am in a hotel room in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, which is currently snowing outside uh, in New Haven. So, you know, you go from D.C. where it's spring and cherry blossoms seem to be on the cusp of happening to snowy, uh, miserable, gray New England. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm feeling a little bit like bottom, the donkey version of bottom. But I'll, I'll soldier on. Uh, uh, as, as Simon was saying, the Merchant of Venice uh, has this really interestingly complicated history or kind of bifocal nature where there's no doubt that it is a play that has been used uh, to propagate these negative images and associations and stereotypes. And yet at the same time, this history of actors, theater artists gravitating to the play uh, for the opposite reason, for the lessons that it can teach us in combating prejudice and combating anti-Semitism and upholding and anti-racist uh, ideology. And John Douglas Thompson uh, certainly is uh, just one in a, a long and proud history. So as a way of beginning to talk about this, this complicated topic, I thought we would start maybe with you, Adam, as the artistic director of the leading Jewish theater company in America, and as someone who thinks about these issues on a daily basis. Um, yeah, maybe your own, your own personal history with the play you studied Elizabethan drama at Brown University. You've worked on workshops of this play. How do you approach this very complicated uh, and you know somewhat delicate topic? Thanks, Drew. It's a great question. Uh, you know, and when I first arrived at Theater J, uh, it was actually one of the first questions I got was, could you see yourself producing Merchant of Venice? And it's a question that comes up regularly. Fortunately, I have an easy answer, which is no, they're doing it at the Shakespeare Theater. So, you know, we're good. Go see it there. Um, you know, I, I struggle with wrapping my head around Merchant of Venice because for me, the play absolutely lets us see the ugliness of anti-Semitism. And I think there's a lot you can learn from watching that, right? And that, that showing anti-Semitic actions and activities and characters on stage doesn't mean a play is anti-Semitic. But yet... Every time I read the play and try to really unpack it, I get caught up in it. I get caught up in the forced conversion of Shylock at the end of the play. I get caught up in the sort of vengeance 
taken upon the character after the fact. The the continual uh, uh, granted that the fact is attempted murder, right? But um, but the continual beating down of Shylock that happens at the end of the play, I can't help when I read it, but think back to what it must have been like to watch that play in Shakespeare's own time. And so even though we see it through a contemporary lens and are able to hopefully have a distance on it, yet at the end of the day, there's a character who's saying, you know, I don't even need the money, I just want a pound of flesh. In so many ways, one of the, the, the most despicable anti-Semitic tropes there is. And despite the, I think, incredibly humanizing power of the uh, of his hath not a Jew eyes at his speech, um, I often feel that in the text, that is in fact the only truly redemptive humanizing moment that the character has. And so what's interesting about watching productions of the play, what I enjoy watching in every single production is how a contemporary director and actors have to take this and figure out how to grapple with it, where to make slight adjustments, not necessarily to the language, but to how it's done, how it's received, so that we can understand a slightly different journey Because I think, this is my theory, when it was produced, we were supposed to end the play hating Shylock. And uh, my assessment of every production I've seen in my lifetime is that we're supposed to end the production feeling horrible for Shylock. And that's a big 180 to do on a text. And so to do that 180, every production has to find lots of what I would sort of call gymnastics, right? Lots of taking a a piece of text and and approaching it in a different way, delivering it in a different way. He's on his ground, on the ground pleading instead of commanding, vice versa, finding different ways to stretch your understanding of it. That's what's so fascinating about watching it um, to me and watching every actor's approach to it, every director's approach to it. But yet at the core for me, it's, I, I will say it's, it's a play I struggle with and, and probably always will because even in the best of productions, I feel like I, I see the work that you have to do to turn it on its head and explore it from the other side. Well, Adam, you'll have to come see uh, our production at the Shakespeare Theater uh, uh, to see maybe not the gymnastics, but the way in which I think Aaron Arbus's production uh, resolves these tensions, uh, I, I think in many ways, uh, brilliantly, and I, I, I want to bring Denia into the conversation here because I think one of the key ways in which this production functions is by not solely focusing on the Shylock story, but also drawing a lot of attention to these other plots in the play. And specifically, you play Jessica, who is the other one of the other Jewish characters in the play. Sorry, Tubal, we're not going to talk about you maybe as much tonight. Um, but Jessica is a very, very interesting role for those who don't remember. Shylock's daughter, and one of the one of only two representations of a female Jewish character in Elizabethan drama, uh, along with the daughter of the Jew of Malta in Marlowe's play. And Jessica's arc is seemingly a simple one of assimilation. Jessica runs away with a, a Christian Venetian named Lorenzo, um, while also stealing her father's Shylock's money. And yet, The way in which this is staged, I don't want to give too much away, but the way in which this is staged makes it a much more complicated arc uh, and plot. And for me, at least, raise the question of assimilation in general. Can one truly ever assimilate and leave behind their own identity, their previous heritage or ancestry or sense of cultural belonging? So I'm just curious to hear, maybe if you could take us inside the process a little bit of how you and the creative team began to develop this this character of Jessica and what it's been like performing uh, performing the role. Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> Jessica is, is, is silent for most of the last act of the play. <clears throat> and that's really where we began <clears throat> at the end. Why, why, why is she silent? Um, and tracing it back through the text, 
it's clear to me, at least, that um, when I leave my father, it's a very um, difficult choice. And I and there is part of me who, who that knows that it's the, the a wrong choice. Um, one of the first things I say in the play is, alack, what heinous sin is it in me to be ashamed to be my father's child? So it's a hate, it's not only a sin, it's a heinous sin. Um, and then uh, when I have made, well, at that point I've already made the decision, but the last time that I see him, I also say, um, I have a, I have a father, are you a daughter lost? So it's, it's really a loss. Um, and, and I've, and, and those two things, I think anchor me in, 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 in Jessica, because yes, I've made the choice um, to assimilate and yet there is no assimilation throughout. Even when I'm with the Christians, they call me an infidel. Um, they call me a stranger. I, I'm not part of that. I'm not part of the world. I'm not part of that world. I, I never will be part of that world. And in being in this production, um, a black Jewish Jessica, um, it's even clearer that there's there's no way because I can't, there's no passing in, in this world um, in terms of race. So it, it feels like I, I, I marked, it, it's not really... <laughs> I don't think there's any real assimilation. And also these are really bad Christians. These are really terrible religious people. They are, they don't follow what, whatever they preach and they don't really preach a lot in, in, in this play. Um, and I think that that's what Shakespeare sh is, is showing us. Um, what, what is it to be? a Christian really besides a, a title. Um, there is no inherent goodness. And I, and I learned that in the play. I don't know that I knew that, um, you know, when the play starts, but throughout the play, I realized that this world is, the grass is not greener uh, on the other side. Um, I think in, for us in our production, uh, John and I have decided that in our relationship, he's very protective of me. So I don't know much about the world out, outside of my home. And even say, you know, um, when Lancelot is, 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 has decided to leave um, uh, Shylock's service, I, I tell him, you know, you, you've, you helped, uh, you helped rid the, the, the home of tediousness. That isn't, it, it's not, it, there's no abuse. I don't, I think that productions that have Shylock abuse Jessica um, are not true to the text. There is no abusive language. There is, even in, in moments when I speak to the, I mean, I won't call, won't call them soliloquies, but the asides that I have to the audience, there's nothing about Shylock hurting me in any way. Why wouldn't I tell the audience that if, if that were the case? Anything I say is, I'm, I'm being sinful. I, it is, you know, my, it's my shame. Right. Um, and in fact, Shylock has very warm language about even Lancelot. Um, very, I think funny, warm language that tells us that he loves us both. Um, and he wants to protect me. So that's, that's, that's the core, I think. Um, that's where I'm, I'm coming from, with Jessica. And then learning that this world that I've decided to dive into for love is corrupt. I mean, I, 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 the fact that I have to give, and I think it was, I don't, I think it was part of the deal. You have to come with all of this money, all of these jewels, in order to marry me. Look, I mean, I think the, the, that was part of the deal with Lorenzo. Yeah. That, and that, that, you know, that, that in and of itself, I think teaches us at least in the, as audience members that, Hmm, what, what, what is this? You know, what is, I think it's love, but is it really? 
yeah, and that much is is unambiguous in the in the text. Uh, Lorenzo says, "I'm going to marry the Jew's daughter for the Jew's money," uh, at one point, or words to that effect. And you know, it's it's interesting thinking about Adam. What you were saying that it, it forces us to experience this really hateful behavior of anti-Semitism. And yet, when you look at the play, and Denia, thank you so much for sharing uh, this this insight. When you look at the play through the eyes. When you look at the other characters in the play through the eyes of Shylock and Jessica, they are really bad Christians uh, who don't practice what they preach and aren't even that religious. They're, they're, they just worship money. So it's it's really interesting to think about Shakespeare writing a kind of critique of not Jews with the play, but writing a critique of Christian society um, instead. Uh, uh, Kendall, I want to bring you into the into this conversation as a as a Jew of color, as a theater maker, uh, uh, yeah, what, what, how do you react to um, to this question and to what Denia and Adam have shared? Oh, yeah, this this play it is <laughs> it is a lot, um, and, and I still remember being relatively young in high school and having to memorize um, soliloquies and ha having to memorize. Portia's soliloquy about the quality of mercy and things of that nature. Um, and back then I, I had one, no idea what I was saying, um, but two, because of my own personal journey at that time, I, I was not Jewish. So it's like, there wouldn't even necessarily been the sense having read through the whole thing, um, like what exactly was going on. But now having gone through this journey, having become Jewish, uh, I am like two months from being a rabbi um, and spending a lot of time figuring out Jewish peoplehood, which can be really confusing um, for folks who don't come, uh, who, who don't necessarily have a lot of exposure to what exactly peoplehood is, because there's the thought, oh, it's just Judaism, it's another religion. It's like, yes, and it's many other things. So it's fascinating now for me to come to this play with these lived experiences of being out in the world where I have experienced um, anti-Semitism. Um, I still remember at one point uh, being at, at, a, at an airport in my kippah, uh, my yarmulke was showing, and someone um, threw a handful of change at me. Um, and so that sense of, oh, by wearing that I have outed myself, um, this is what anti-Semitism means and looks like in a, in a physical embodied way. So it's like when I see this production now and, and I see the way in which it is enacted, it just hits me. Um, it hits me to my core. And then to have Black Jewishness <laughs> represented, uh, oh my goodness, I mean, this, this, this particular production tore me up in profound ways that were at once beautiful and also brutal and um, really left me wrestling with that sense of, I mean, there's always the question of, can you exchange one identity for another? But what actually can we say, like, what happens when you exist in between identities, when you truly exist in a liminal space, um, which um, many Jews of color do still today? Um, but what's also fascinating is like also trying to put on my historical goggles and not necessarily, you know, use my present perspective to project it back into the past. And it's the ways in which Jews were at that time um, uh, in the Italian states were like simply not allowed to pass. Um, so, so it's a really heady and also visceral mix of curiosity, revulsion, um, so much, and yet there's also, I mean, with Shylock's um, famous monologue, uh, there's also that sense of like, oh my goodness, this beautiful, beautiful soliloquy and like just really, <laughs> just getting at the deep humanity of someone who truly when reading the text, I think I agree with Adam that it almost seems as if we're supposed to end at, get to the end and be like, yeah, I don't really like Shylock so much. He's not great. He's a bad person, but to have that moment of like humanity is such a breath of fresh air. And so to feel at times when purely reading it, that that gets undermined by the rest of it um, can be really hard. That being said, I think this production, I, I live in Brooklyn, so 
I've had the chance to encounter it, really opens up a fresh perspective. And for that, I'm really grateful. Yeah, yeah. Lots of, uh, lots of interesting uh, thinking going on, difficult thinking about uh, what is in many ways a difficult play. And yet, as we were reflecting last week in our conversation with, with Jeffrey Horowitz and Jonathan Kalb, uh, there's a lot of humor in this play as well. There's a lot of comedy uh, and the way in which Shakespeare's not just setting tragedy against comedy in the play, he's setting the phenomenon of prejudice and anti-Semitism against comedy. And the comedy keeps on getting interrupted by these uncomfortable moments, uh, like the one that you uh, so vividly described, Kendall. And I, I wanna thank you for, for sharing that lived experience uh, with us in this, in this space. Uh, yeah, Simon, I'm wondering, uh, mm. an artistic director and a, and a director himself, you know, Adam's talked about mm. wrestling with the text, doing, mm. doing gymnastics, as you put it, Adam, uh, mm. and Denai has sort of taken us inside the process of starting at the end, starting with silence, mm. and kind of going back and decoding the play. Uh, mm. so yeah, I'm just wondering if you have any kind of like directorial thoughts about mm. some of these like artistic choices that are being made or talked about or discussed that are also social and political ones, because there's there's no more social or political art form, ultimately, than the theater. Yes, goodness me. Um, thank you um, to our panelists for articulating such complicated and well thought through positions. I'm, I'm sure like many of us watching the episode today, I'm, I'm processing a lot and thinking it through. Um, I, I suppose, Adam, on a, on a directorial point of view, I certainly know gymnastics. I've certainly you know, done a lot of them myself in trying to kind of manage a play into a slightly different shape than maybe it was when it was first written. I suppose um, what was interesting for me embarking on this project with such experienced and thoughtful artists was that I felt that the gymnastics that you're describing would be, would be more deep tectonic thoughtfulness about the play's resonance helpfully for now. And I feel and of course, Adam, I'm really looking forward to sharing the production with you to see what you, whether you feel this or not. But I feel like talking to folks that, that, that have undergone the, the, the seeing it. And actually, Jonathan Cowell, the dramaturg on the show last week, spoke about this very thing of there's one thing to read the play, there's one thing also to hear of the play in your mind. There's another thing to sit in the theatre and, and live it, in particularly in, in this context. The sense of it being a very dark satire on the conditions in which prejudice is, prejudice is generated in is very foregrounded, I would say. And I think the sensitization to the roots of damaging thinking is very particular. And it's interesting for me about Shakespeare because sometimes he is, I think there's a great discussion about how flexible Shakespeare actually is. But um, uh, I, for example, have loved setting Hamlet in a West African context, which was a full transposition of that play with a certain group of actors at a certain moment when it felt the play needed to speak differently. And I was reminded of Peter Brook's line, the secret play, which is the play that you're trying to get with that group in that moment in history. And it's your secret and your job is to bring that secret out. And if you go deeply into that and your collaborators are right, and sensitive and open, what's going to emerge is a play that is different to the original play. And sometimes that's successfully achieved and sometimes it's not. And we have to be very vigilant, I think, especially approaching a play that is so problematic as sort of this one, about what that transposition and what the secret play is going to be. And we must all be held accountable, I think, for the success of, or failure of that. I think it does also generate, in, you know, therefore, in the theatre, a, a different kind of watching of the play. There's a kind of, I mean, Kendall talks about the emotional journey, the experience, the difficulty, the challenge of watching it, because you're watching it not in a passive, oh, kind of entertainment way. You're, you're, you're watching it with a very strong invitation to work, to decode, to challenge, to interrogate. And that, if you almost, we could say, Brechtian quality of engaging politically an audience in figuring meanings out, that side of it feels very positive. And I hope that's something that, you know, I'm sure will happen actively in Washington as it has in New York. Um, so those are some, some kind of responses. But I'm also conscious, Drew, that our, our audience might have 
might have thoughts, they might have questions, I'm sure many. Uh, we can go around, uh, uh, but um, maybe we'll have some questions just to share from Drew, so we can be kind of processing them, and then I'm going to do my little trailer for the weeks to come, and then we can ask our panellists to maybe speak to some of the questions that have come from the audience, or indeed enlarge some of the positions that we've shared. But over to you, Drew. Yeah, well, uh, Sierra has been sharing a lot of questions. There has been a, a veritable flood of questions coming through uh, uh, on the chat to me. Um, so I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them. So I, I want to try to see if I can like pick out some of the most uh, mm. interesting or, or, or provocative uh, uh, ones. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this is that one, but I think it's worth just like pulling out because it's very reflective of this current moment uh, that we are in this 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 like historical moment of the last two weeks uh, from Robin Swope. What impact, if any, does Vladimir Putin's attempted quote denazification of a country with a Jewish leader, Vladimir Zelensky? Have on the plane. I, I, I don't. We're, none of us are experts in geopolitics, uh, but just an example of how contemporary events in the world can radically shift the meaning of what you see on the stage in between the performance in Brooklyn and it arriving uh, in Washington. Uh, 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 Kathy Rondon asks, "Do you think there's a lesson to be learned uh, about tribalism as opposed to religion in the Merchant of Venice, and is that particularly salient right now?" Mm -hmm. uh, anonymous question for Adam, who I, I think someone has an admirer. Could Shakespeare be going for cheap laughs in the worst anti-Semitism in the play? For example, the joke about the price of pork. Uh, it seems that there are deeper passages that are more reflective and sympathetic, citing does not uh, a Jew bleed, hath not a Jew eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and Deborah asks, is Shylock a bad person? I wouldn't call him a villain. I think he's just reacting to the people around him and his environment. I mean, should we really expect Shylock to take the high road after years and years of anti-Semitism? Deborah, it's sort of a comment that she's sharing uh, uh, in the chat. Um, but just an example of like all the, the kinds right. of thinking that this conversation uh, is stirring up, a very, a very lively, heady stew. Great. Well, true. thank you. Well, uh, we all attempt to remember as many of those points and questions as we can, and indeed not only remember the questions, but prepare some kind of potential response to them. I'm going to say uh, on your screen uh, now or shortly, you should be able to see the episodes we have scheduled for next week and beyond. Um, we hope to see you at the theatre with us uh, to, of course, see The Motion to Venice and with us on Zoom to explore, um, I think we have one more episode of Motion to Venice and then um, Shakespeare Hours to come to accompany uh, Our Town and Red Velvet. Okay, fantastic. So I think, shall we um, invite Adam, hi, just to speak to some of those um, interesting and provocative points raised by our audience. Oh, but Drew, we'll fight to you first. And Adam, you also messaged me that um, you were interested in putting Shylock in a broader Shakespearean context with figures such as Richard III mm. or possibly even Macbeth, these characters who are complicated, but who he presents with a lot of humanity. And you also have thoughts on passing. This idea of passing has, has jogged loose some ideas with you. So I, I want to give you the platform uh, to share those thoughts. Sure, though I think the, the audience questions are super interesting. And I'm really interested in that last question, which is, is Shylock a bad person? Um, and, I, you know, taking sort of Simon's really brilliant helping us understand the difference between what I would call a play and a production, right? That they they are two different works of art and can have deeply different meanings. And I have not seen this production. But I will make an argument that yes, as written, Shylock is a pretty bad person, justifiably so perhaps, right? Richard III, I will also argue, is a bad person. And if you watch you know, Henry VI parts one, two, and three, and Richard the Third. you have a real good sense of why he's the way he is, right? What has pushed him to the places that he's at? But yet he is also a, like, multiple murderer. Um, and, you know, in the case of the Shylock that we are presented in the script, again, not this production necessarily, um, absolutely horrible things happen to him. He's certainly called names, right? He's certainly treated terribly, um, uh, uh, spit upon. He describes many things that happen to him, but his solution is murder. His solution is to kill a person. And I, I will argue that, that that is sort of like, the, kind of like a bad thing to do. And that, that the play, I think, um, when done well in production, 
makes us understand where he's coming from, the pain, the hurt, the betrayal that his entire world has given to him, the loss of his daughter, everything that's led up to this that gets him to that place. But my argument is that, uh, I think my argument is that, uh, my, my draft argument, I'll say, is that yes, in, indeed, I think as written, he's presented to be pretty villainous um, and often produced to be a sympathetic character in production. Um, you know, I, I am so, I was so um, excited, Kendall, by hearing what you were talking about, about this, the, some of the questions that this play raised for you, because one of the things, and, and again, having not seen it, I'm, I'm really interested in this. I'm working on this play right now that is very much inspired by it. And one of the things that happens early in the play is a character looks to another character and says, Jew, first character goes, Nathan, like, let's not be so formal or something like that. Um, they call him a Jew. And, and it, it got to this question of how do they know on site that he's a Jew, right? And I think about this play and I think that, you know, when written and originally performed, I imagine Shakespeare imagined Jewishness to be something visible as it would be in like, for instance, today, the Orthodox community something that one might see. I, I, and so I'm really interested in this idea of thinking about how Jewishness then might be informed by our understanding of how racism works then and now and everywhere. That is to be very exciting to consider and, and ponder and to enrich my understanding of the play. So now, now for a counterpoint, because I know Denai, you were, you were, I saw your face, it was very expressive. And I know that Jim Shapiro, author of Shakespeare and the Jews was one of the consultants uh, on the production at Theater for a New Audience. So yeah, this question of Shakespeare being, of Shylock being a bad guy. Uh, and also I should note, he never ex explicitly says he wants to murder Antonio. He says he wants a pound of flesh. According to you, Adam, that is murder. I do not understand it personally. Uh, as murder, it's it's a pound of flesh, whatever that means, right? Uh, but yeah, Denai, I'm wondering if if you have a rebuttal to Adam, or if this is something you talked about when you were rehearsing the play specifically about Jews and passing, whether they were physically distinct in Shakespearean practice versus now. Yes. So um, a couple of things. I Portia, when she first come, I'm going to go. You, I'm going to start from the last thing you said, which is. Um, you, you believe that Shakespeare visualized Jews, like there was, there was a visual distinction between Jews and Christians. And I disagree because Portia walks in to, um, the court and she says, which is the Jew and which is the merchant? And I think that because these people are in this community, they know who in Venice, they know who is Jewish because they are, they know, they, they already know one another. And perhaps, um, uh, you know, they were made to live in, in what was not then thought of as a ghetto, but essentially a ghetto behind a wall. So, so however, and I think our production does this, well, there is no re there's no real way to tell Jews and Christians apart unless you already know um, that someone might be Jewish or Christian, or maybe they're wearing a yarmulke, as Kendall um, said. But Portia doesn't know anything about Jews and comes in and she's like, who's who's the Jew? Uh, and I think that's very telling. <clears throat> um and sure, we can argue that Shakespeare meant that as a joke, that clearly this person was wearing something that, may, you know, that made them, this, this actor is wearing something that made them clearly Jewish and the whole audience laughed. But we don't know. We don't know. We don't know that. Um, and then I, I think that, um, I think it's important to make the distinction between someone who, who, who behaves badly and is just and is a bad person i don't think that shylock is a psychopath um i i don't i think that he is capable of love i think that that is in the text um i think that obviously he's capable of 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 pain and he's capable of vengeance and he said and he says that you know says the, the you taught me this 
Christians, you taught me how to revenge and I'm going to use it against you now. So we can, yes. Is, is that, is that immoral? Yes. Is he a bad person? I think we get into some really sticky things then because we have a, a lot of convicts who are, who have committed crimes um, and are not bad people, right? Like their circumstances led them to whatever they, whatever crime they committed. So, I, so I, I, I think of Shylock like that, not a bad person. He's not Iago, you know, he's not telling the audience, like, I'm just, I'm over here. I'm evil. I love this, you know? Um, and, and I think that characters in Shakespearean plays uh, reveal themselves to the audience. And what he reveals is he has, what he says about, about Antonio when we first see them all together is I hate him for he's a Christian. And then later he says, he's, he has spit on me. He's, he has spurned me and spurned means to kick. And, and we don't necessarily get that, but he has been, he has had the be kicked out of him uh, regularly. He has been beaten by this man. So when someone has physically beaten you in your place of work and worship and home, I, I, I mm-hmm. that's something I think can, can, I think we can understand. I don't think that he's made to be sympathetic in production. I think that the text tells us that he has been, even before the play begins, he has been abused. Right. Wow. I mean, this is a, I mean, a, a, a Shakespearean debate in terms of, uh, I mean, finely balanced. Um, I, 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 Kendall, I wonder whether we, we can bring you into this, into this discussion, or indeed the broader one, or indeed remembering some of the, also the other provocations that came from the audience that you, you, you might want to kind of address, Kendall. Sure. So I think I find myself in a way kind of splitting the difference uh, bet, bet, between you all, because I think one of the, I, I think, Denier, you're so right. It's hard for us to tell what exactly uh, Shakespeare like intended was going for, but it's like the fact that we have this play. And so, and once a play gets out, it's the like first thing, it kind of has a rhetorical position. And then secondly, once it's in front of an audience, like the audience takes it in whatever way the audience wants to take it. And given the cultural context back then, and there was a good portion of time where Jews were not permitted, not only in Shakespeare's, you know, England, but also like there, there's the reality of, you know, Jews being uh, walled up and made to wear certain things that would actually distinguish them inside of Venice and inside of like papal states uh, uh, and things like that. So it's like, I, I think that I'm, it's true. I can't know what Shakespeare meant, but it's like, as I start to think of like all of that context, it's like, ah, oh, what, what, what am I to make of this? Um, that being said, I also really agree with you though, Denia, about the sense of we, we do get to understand, and especially honestly in this production, we get to understand why Shylock does what he does. Like you get the sense of the brutality of um, the Christians who are surrounding him and how they um, he's responding almost in a way by upping the ante and being like, okay, you will treat me like the Jew. Well, you know what? I'm actually going to take one of these very, this very trope where you're always talking about, we're concerned with, you know, the blood of, um, you know, sacraments and things like that. And, you know, flesh uh, of, you know, Jesus's sacrifice and that we're always desecrating it. Well, okay. Y- y- I- I'm up, up to Annie. You know what? You don't pay this. I'm actually going to, I'm going to, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take, I'm going to take a pound of your flesh. Um, and I mean, we can get into a really nice discussion about like whether that is moral, amoral or whatnot. But I think one of the things that brought up for me seeing this production specifically is <laughs> when do black people get to be angry and when are they allowed to hold their anger or when are they told actually that's too much you need to calm down you need to sit back um and also i would say you know by virtue of my existing in multiple communities 
that also feels the same for Jews uh, in a certain way, like with the rise in anti-Semitism that we're seeing, you know, world round and the sense of like that feeling of the contingency of like Jewish life, Jewish reality, and to say, oh goodness, we are being targeted. And then to have some people say, uh, but are you really? And it's like, <laughs> when do Jews get to be angry about that? So I know that I keep going back to my very personal perspective of how I'm viewing this, um, but it, I, I think it's just because there's so much that's so rich that this production specifically brings up. Um, anyways, that was that was a rambling of thoughts, kind of bringing some things together. No, not at all, Kendall. And one one of the things that this conversation is making me think of is one of the great themes of this play uh, that is also reflected uh, in a lot of modern drama. You mentioned Brecht, uh, Simon, which is what does it mean to be a good person in an immoral world? What does it mean to be a bad guy if Shylock is a bad guy in a world where, as he points out in the middle of the trial scene, Venetians can buy and sell slaves, right? Like what is the life of this one Venetian merchant worth when you trade hundreds of lives every day as if they are commodities, right? <clears throat> and this exposure of a double standard uh, that exists uh, to, to, in many ways today, as you're saying, like for Jews, for black, for people of color, for black people, uh, they are, they're upheld to a different standard of morality in a world where standards of morality seemingly do not apply to those who are in privileged positions. And this is one of the extremely resonant uh, themes that Shakespeare was so prescient in, in pointing out. Um, I do want to, I know we like to have, we like to share text or have some textual exegesis in the second half of the show. And I, I, I hope we can get to all of, all of the texts that our, our guests want to share because this has been such a rich conversation. We've gotten a little bit carried away with time. And I also have another question about a Jewish prayer that is in this production, uh, which we were having a fascinating conversation about uh, before we went live. So I'm going to shut up now. Um, and I will, Denia, can I maybe volunteer you to share maybe some, some a passage of text for us to ponder and think about? Sure. Um, I'm just going to pull it up. Um, okay, so at the top of Act 5, Lorenzo and Jessica have this little scene, um, and I won't give away what's in our production. I will say that it is often played as, as um, a, a very amorous love scene. Um, and some of the text is, I won't read all of it, but some of the text is, um, Lorenzo starts, the moon shines bright in such a night as this, when the sweet wind did gently kiss the trees and they did make no noise in such a night, Troilus methinks mounted the Trojan walls and sighed his soul toward the Grecian tents where Cressid lay that night. Then I respond in such a night, did Thisbe fearfully or trip the dew and saw the lion's shadow air himself and ran dismayed away. Then Lorenzo responds about Dido waiting, um, waiting waiting for Aeneas. And then I talk about Medea. And then he talks about me stealing away from my father. And then I talk about him and say, I tell, I say that he stole my soul with many vows of faith and ne'er a true one. So um, this piece of text uh, is, is one in which the poetry is beautiful. The writing is beautiful because Shakespeare wrote it. And they're talking about these lovers that have horrible things happen to them. Um, Troilus mounts the Trojan walls and sees Cressida cheating on him. Uh, Thisbe sees a lion when she's meant to, um, to meet Pyramus and runs away. Then Pyramus finds something that she dropped and then kills himself. Then she comes back and kills herself. Um, it, it, Dido waits for Aeneas and Aeneas has abandoned her. Um, Medea saves Jason's father and then Jason betrays her and she kills their children. So the, what the text is, is the poetry is beautiful, but what the text is telling us are very ugly things, relationships that are falling apart in the most horrendous ways. A lot of blood, betrayal, um, murder. So I'll, 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 I'll leave you with that and I'll leave you with that to come and see 
you know, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but isn't it interesting the way that you've identified something which is two things simultaneously? I mean, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made, said Emmanuel Kant. And I'm just thinking about the crooked timber of Shakespeare that you've kind of exposed there for us, which is which is wonderful. Um, yeah, let's, um, Kendall, maybe you have a little text thought or something, a bit of language or, or rumination that you'd like to share. Sure. I mean, I, I know that my teachers in rabbinical school would really wish that this would be the moment that I would bring something from Torah or the Bible or maybe even the Talmud or something like that. But since I have a very expansive understanding of what rabbinic text is, um, I, I am going to quote um, someone who is one of my rabbis, and that is the um, great scholar of old um, W.E.B. Du Bois um, from The Souls of Black Folk. So. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever fills his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unrecoiled strive, unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In this merging, he wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. He does not wish to Africanize America, for America has too much to teach the world and Africa. He wouldn't bleach his Negro blood in a flood of white Americanism, for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. And the, so that is the quote. And the last thing that I will add to it, like when I watched this production, this came up in my mind and my simple addition to this really powerful stuff is that in being Black, American, and Jewish, it really does feel as if there is a triple self in watching this piece. So I'll leave it at that. That is so beautiful, Kendall. I, I had my eyes closed while you were reading that and was just letting it wash over me. It's really powerful. Thank you. Um, yeah, Adam, I'm interested in hearing, uh, there's a, is there a passage of text from, from this play from Lessing's Nathan the Wise, uh, a yeah. play that's certainly in conversation with The Merchant of Venice? I, I'm probably the Washington, D.C.'s number one Lessing fan. Uh, it's, yes, it's a, it's a very cool play, but I, I, I will save that for those who want to talk about it after you've seen it. You know, there's a section that, that for me of Merchant um, feels like one of the most interesting places to watch in any production. Um, because it's a it's a section that you have to do something with. You can't just leave it. Um, and so just to take you to where we are, we're in Act 4, Scene 1. Shylock's attempted to just take a pound of flesh just near the heart. Nothing serious near the heart. Um, they've said, oh, well, you'll spill blood. This is a total spoiler alert if those of you who haven't read the play. Sorry about that. Uh, they say, you know, you're going to, uh, you're, if you're going to spill blood, you're not allowed to do that. Jews are not allowed to spill Christian blood specifically. So, so now, now you've got a problem. He, he says, oh, all right, well, I guess I'm not going to do that. Uh, I don't want to die because of murder. They then say, well, you have attempted murder on you now. So, right, you, you tried to murder someone. So you have to give up everything you own. Half of it goes to the state. Half of it goes to the you know, guy you were going to kill. I might be getting some of this wildly wrong, but Drew, you'll correct me if I've got the general if I go in any totally wrong paths um, and, you know, your life is at the discretion of, of the, of the Duke um, and the Duke's like, ah, oh, you can live. And, uh, and the, the person Antonio, I think, yes, Antonio, who he was going to kill says, you know, I don't need to just take the money. I will, I will, I will borrow it and pay it back or whatever he says, he'd loan it to me. I'll use it, whatever he says and give it to me when he dies. And on the condition that Shylock become a Christian. Uh, and Shylock's like, you know, like the pressure is high. And the only thing he says in that moment is, I am content, three words. Uh, uh, and this to me is one of the moments to look at the play. And because and, it's the one of the moments you're going to see in every production, 
some of the brilliance of the of the choices of the interpretation of how you do that line how you how you navigate through that how content is he really um how uh, in what way does he deliver it his i think he only has like three more lines in the play and they're like oh I, you know i'll sign it all later i gotta go home i'm in a really bad mood is basically what he says after that um so i'm excited about that piece of text not because it's so revelatory because it is actually so blank mm. because it is so open for us all to look at and interpret and i cannot wait to see what this production does with it if this production even retains those three lines as often lots of trims and cuts happen Denial. Denial. Really quickly, um, because Simon, you mentioned Jim Shapiro um, earlier, I'll say that uh, Jim talked to us about this play um, as a, a canvas of, in a lot of ways, because so, and, and he, he talked about it as, as maybe the play that ha leaves mo more up to interpretation than any other Shakespearean play. Um, and I think that was, I, I think that's brilliant. I think that in a lot of ways, Shakespeare is a, a prophet and he is, he's using this play um, or we're using this play to hold up a mirror to what's going on in society right now um, as he as he did as well. I don't know how he wasn't censored with some of this. Honestly, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that, that, oh, that canvas is something that, um, Jim talked about as well. And you know, Adam, when you were talking about I am content, uh, it made me think of Leontes in The Winter's Tale when he touches Hermione, the statue comes to life. And instead of this long poetic speech, he says she's warm. And Shakespeare has this, he has this way of giving us these monosyllables instead of uh, a lot of verbiage that are, I find very pregnant with emotion with unspoken emotion and this is why i always argue that yes shakespeare was a brilliant poet he was also truly a theater artist and a theater worker and you can only apprehend some of the senses in behind those words by experiencing his plays uh, in the theater and you know we've sort of come full circle to this idea that the merchant of venice yes you can endlessly talk about the meanings of the play or what's textually justified and yet the experience of the play in the theater is so genuinely hard to put into words, to fathom. You can never get to the bottom of it, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And certainly in that moment, I am content. All the, th all the things that Shylock is thinking and feeling in that moment has to be seen uh, in the theater. Uh, we may not have time to answer this, but it, there's an excellent question that just came in uh, at the last minute from a uh, viewer, Jared, who praises Kendall's apt and excellent quote, from Du Bois and asks, does anyone else see a parallel between Shylock and Othello? Uh, as accomplished as Othello is, who's also a Venetian, so there's something about Venice, uh, also a place set in Venice, he is brought down by his quote, animal instincts as the racists in the play predict. In both cases, Shylock and Othello might have lived happily if they weren't pushed. So very provocative. Uh, question here about Othello and Shylock, which we don't have time to answer. Uh, so tune in next week. And we'll get the answer. Uh, Simon, over well, to you. I, 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 I'm thinking through, um, uh, I'm not sure what the status of our well, Shakespeare Hour Live newsletter is, but this might be something uh, that we could unpack there. And I, it would be very nice to collect some thoughts from our guests on that extraordinary question. And perhaps true for you to share their responses via the newsletter, um, which could be a great, a great mechanism of keeping the debate alive. I'm certainly thinking that the kind of theatre that I think you're describing true and that we all care about is the kind of theatre in a way that we've also experienced tonight. I.e. we haven't been speaking as characters, we've been speaking as ourselves, but we've been articulating and bringing to life a wide array of viewpoints and positions and actually as a group together, finding out where our sympathies and differences and common territories lie. And I feel like that's been a very moving hour. So my thank you to the guests. I, I, I might, another um, uh, memory came to me during our conversation this evening, inspired by the guest who asked the question about the current tragic events in Ukraine. This was also the week when the Ukrainian president addressed the House of Commons, uh, House of Parliament in England, and during his speech referred to the line of Shakespeare's to be or not to be. And 
saying in a heartbreaking way that they choose to be. So, uh, our world remains extremely complicated, painful and upsetting, and yet there is compassion, shared language, shared endeavours uh, to keep bringing us uh, some hope in the dark. Our next episode of Shakespeare Alive will focus on the play's representation of gender and sexuality in The Merchant of Venice, and we'll be joined by Isabel Arezu, who plays Portia in the production, and also by Dr. Carla Della Gatta, who is a frequent panel miss of the Shakespeare Alive. Live. So some of you will recognize her, and I'm certainly excited to be bringing Carla back and others. So I hope you'll join us on Wednesday, March the 16th for that third episode. Uh, my thanks again to our, our wonderful, wonderful panel tonight. The discussion continues via newsletter. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And do uh, make it, if possible, to see the motion to Venice in our theatres uh, from, uh, from the end of this month. Okay, very good. Good night. Goodbye. See you next time.